Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? So, so the next session is about Geoscience Australia. Geoscience Australia was looking to push the boundaries and create a meaningful digital change within their organization with this pilot project, which aimed to create a new standardized digital platform for their web properties. The presenter for this session is Stuart Ronans. He's the CTO at Salsa Digital. He's involved in the Geoscience Australia project from a solution a solution architecture perspective and has been working with the GovCMS team since its early beginnings. He's an advocate for open source, Jamstack, and the static web. Over to you, Stu. All the best. Great. Thanks, Sushi. Uh, cool. So I can assume everyone can see the slides uh, and I'll hear a whisper in my ear if not. Uh, so, yep. Perfect intro. Thanks, Sushi. We are talking about uh, an ambitious digital experience platform specifically Geoscience Australia, uh, the journey that they went on to create this entirely decoupled uh, static web um, hosting platform. Um, so let's get into it. Hi, uh, I'm Stuart Rollins, uh, CTO at Salsa Digital. Uh, we're supposed to be joined by co-presenter Kristen today. Unfortunately, uh, she heard her back earlier this week, uh, so I've taken it off her plate. She may be lurking uh, in the background if you're there. Hi, Kristen. I uh, hope you're feeling better soon. Um, a lot of the work that I'm presenting is Kristen's, the slides are Kristen's. Um, really, I'm just a glorified cheerleader at this point um, to promote all of the great work that uh, Kristen and the team did here. Okay, so what we're talking about today. Uh, first of all, who was involved in this? Uh, it was a very collaborative um, project. Uh, multiple organizations came together to, to get this one out the door. Uh, why re-platform? So what were the driving uh, issues, challenges that the organization was facing? Uh, how it was put together, the tools and processes, um, how Drupal was built and how it all came together. Um, the wins and challenges, uh, what the future of the platform might look like, uh, which ties into some of the conversation that you may have um, seen in the, the keynote uh, via Lee, uh, and then back into questions in the hallway track after that. Okay, so the organizations that made the magic happen. Uh, there were a few, uh, beginning with Today Design and their excellent user-centric um, research and design that built the design system that fed into this project. Um, Geoscience Australia, who's the um, organization, the entity that actually um, embarked on this journey. Uh, Salsa Digital, service provider, delivering on the project and uh, GovCMS. So we'll touch on who each of these organizations are in a bit more detail. Um, so Geoscience Australia, GA, uh, as they're known, is Australia's preeminent public sector geoscience organization. The nation's trusted advisor on the geology and geography of Australia. Uh, they apply science and technology to describe and understand the earth for the benefit of Australia. Uh, so they're doing some incredibly cool stuff with incredibly rich scientific data sets, uh, have amazing technical products that sit on top of those data sets and allow it to be surfaced and better understood by data scientists and, um, uh, and citizens. And as I mentioned, today design, they were integral to the project, uh, working with Geoscience Australia to better understand their needs, to create this cohesive design system um, that met their current day requirements, but was also flexible and um, would cover the requirements of all of the programs and bodies of work within the organization into the future. I uh, can't say enough good things about the incredible work that uh, Today Design do and are doing. 
um, and us, Salsa Digital. Uh, so we're an open source company made of digital engineers from across the globe uh, with a primary focus in government uh, and primarily to create or assist governments become more open, connected and consolidated. Uh, and Digital Earth Australia. So they are the first pilot site launched on a new platform and a program within Geoscience Australia. And they've got some awesome satellite imagery and incredibly rich scientific data um, that is surfaced through their new site on the platform. Uh, so why did we do this? Let's go through the rationale and the goals for this new platform. Uh, so GA needed an efficient, cost-effective, secure, and resilient uh, digital experience platform that allows users to discover, identify, and consume Australian Earth data. Um, so it was all about trying to create a cohesive set of standardized platforms, tools, content uh, creation, and presentation layers uh, to assist in making very rich scientific data more discoverable um, and easy to understand. Some of the challenges that they are facing are probably familiar to many. Um, and many large organizations obviously face similar challenges when it comes to fragmentation. Uh, and fragmentation across technologies, um, largely driven by the fact that you have many programs, many groups, many people who use different technologies, different uh, CMSs, JavaScript frameworks, um, all the way through to you know, processes and everything else that comes with that. Um, so they use Squiz, various versions of Drupal, various different JavaScript frameworks, uh, mapping solutions, and, and so on. Um, and these solutions are hosted both internally and externally. So maintenance ongoing is just a mishmash of um, yeah, various applications in various different places. So off the back of that, there are a few obvious goals. Uh, to reduce or remove duplication at both a technical and content level, uh, to promote content sharing, so creation of content in central places and uh, reuse that across various web properties um, and even beyond the web. Um, a great editorial user experience uh, to meet and exceed compliance requirements. Um, easy setup was a big one. So specifically to measure the time to create new sites or onboard new web properties uh, measured in minutes rather than hours or days. Uh, to unify the tech solutions involved in the platform, to create consistent user experience, not only from a public interface, but from a back-end content authoring perspective, um, and to have accessibility built in from the offset. Uh, underpinning that on the platform level, there are some goals and there, are, there is some overlap here. So behind that, we need to make a platform that's secure, robust, resilient, uh, scalable to the organization's growing needs. Uh, and what we're talking about is, uh, you know, we're creating these standard models and the standard con consistent way of working, but we don't want it to be rigid. We need to have interoperability, configurability, and a modular design that allows the platform to continue to grow and evolve uh, with needs of the organization. Uh, it needs to be easy to maintain, so central maintenance that can benefit everyone. Uh, and again, all of this is uh, built with accessibility in mind. So a visual representation of what that means, it's all very obvious before, fragmented, after consolidated. We've got all of these individual sites, all of these um, bespoke user experiences, concept models, um, CMS technologies, JavaScript frameworks, um, and moving these into consolidated platform. Uh, okay, so how did we do this? Well, yes, hint, it's more than Drupal. Uh, there's a lot that went into this. Um, so design system started with the design system by Today Design. So they worked on creating a really rich and modular design system um, at a granular component, you know, atomic level uh, with a bigger picture vision in mind that all of these components could be brought together to create cohesive web experiences. Um, so there's a very rich um, tapestry of 40 odd different design components uh, that when merged together create um, a, a great web experience. So I always had to keep that uh, high on the prize and the end goal with all these components working well together. Uh, behind the scenes, the tech stack can be broken up into uh, three buckets. So um, on the back end, we're talking about Drupal and content stores. So Drupal running on GovCMS, both the distribution and the GovCMS hosting platform. 
uh, and using JSON API to expose content. Uh, so this is a um, decoupled platform. In the middleware, we've got GitHub Actions, which is our CI layer, uh, which is responsible for the build and deploy process. Uh, so we use Nux.js to compile a static artifact, the entire static websites, uh, and we push that to the front end, the static edge. Uh, the static edge is driven by QuantCDN, which is content delivery network for uh, static websites. We have a integration with Algolia for search. And again, you're interfacing as an end user with that compiled um, Vue.js components. Uh, OK, so we'll dig into some of these other uh, technologies in a bit more detail, starting with our friends GovCMS. Uh, GovCMS has been around for seven years now. Uh, 347 sites, which uh, is probably a lie. They seem to be growing at a pretty rapid rate. Um, and uh, GovCMS were great in all of the early conversations and conversations around what we were hoping to do with this project. Um, because at the end of the day, we wanted to show that you can build decoupled um, platforms on GovCMS without the need to um, go too far above what the core distribution and the core offering provides. And um, so uh, thanks to GovCMS for coming to the party. Um, and on the Drupal architecture side of things, uh, we'll start at the bottom right. Uh, 160 modules, most of which is the Drupal distribution. Uh, so as I mentioned, we didn't need to add a whole lot to the distribution to build this solution, uh, largely driven by the fact that uh, the uh, API first initiative allowed Drupal from D8 to start moving towards uh, these decoupled architectures. So yeah, it, it really is a lot of core and minimal contrib. Uh, on the paragraph side of things in the content schema, 21 paragraph types, as I mentioned before, something in the order of 40 odd uh, design components. So those map broadly to these paragraph types. What we did though is make paragraph types more configurable. So instead of having very verbose, uh, you know, massive list of paragraphs. We've got a slimmer set, and they can be configured so they can be tailored to actually render and map to the different front-end components. Uh, the vocabularies, 13, uh, largely these are split between back-end administrative content tagging as well as um, enabling content to become searchable through facets and filters, um, as well as some system vocabs, which we'll touch on. Um, roles out of the box, GovCMS, menus, uh, you know, per site menus, um, media types, text formats, and views, not used heavily, largely because of decoupled nature, we're using very structured data and using um, JSON API to expose it. We don't want, um, you know, rich WYSIWYG HTML content. We want it to be as structured as possible. Uh, and one content type to rule them all. Uh, so we'll talk about that content type a little bit. Um, what we have is a multi-site Drupal installation where sites are managed through a site's vocabulary. So you create sites in the vocab, you configure them with all of the things that a site needs to exist, such as what its menu, uh, what its menu is, uh, you know, what the header and footer configurations are, what the uh, analytics plugin uh, identifiers are, uh, and that's all just a taxonomy term to create a new site, create a new term, configure it, right? and away you go. On the content side of things, uh, it's equally simple. There's a single content type with the page type uh, subcomponent, which allows grouping of content. Because of the nature of the design system, you can basically embed those design components in any order, um, which allows for a very simple uh, and intuitive way of just attaching paragraphs and putting them on a page. Um, so we don't have a lot of uh, complex content schemas in the CMS. Uh, at the end of the day, what we get out of Drupal is a pretty rich um, content backend. So as I mentioned before, that simple site setup is key. Uh, the fact that you can just create a new site by adding and configuring a taxonomy term means that you really can just start creating new sites and new content very, very rapidly. Um, there's a inheritance model with the site text fallback, which effectively means that sites that aren't configured with their own content can inherit from their parent. Um, component reusability is a cool feature. 
which allows you to have a library of components. So for instance, if you create one of these paragraph components, uh, you can actually embed that and reuse that throughout the site. Um, there is a content cloning feature. Uh, reference content in this case refers to the fact that content can have a different contextual view uh, as a reference piece of content. So if you embed it in a card, it can have uh, yeah, more contextualized uh, representation of that content. Um, the customizable search stuff we'll touch on a little bit later, but it's a content managed search solution. As I mentioned, we use Algolia on the front end to render the search. Um, but you can actually create an embedded search component directly as content in the CMS. What that means is you can basically say, I want to inject a search widget here. Um, I want to filter it by these page types. I want to display these facets based on these taxonomies. Um, and it's zero development effort required. It's all just additional content. Uh, there is rich content taking for search, which enables a lot of that, feature uh, that, that functionality. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, content sharing between sites. So when you create content, you can take it to a primary site and share it with others. Um, on the left, you can see an example of these page type templates. Uh, so while I said that you, know, you can create a single piece of content and put any component uh, in any order, uh, what GA are doing and what the other web properties are doing are to create standard page type templates, which can be reused as the base. So for instance, they've got a product template here um, they use this as the basis for all of their products. Uh, so it just comes with placeholder values that need replacing uh, to keep things nice and consistent. Uh, along a similar line, there are master component templates. So I mentioned before that we have this component reusability function. Um, the same applies to those paragraphs. At paragraph level, you have a, a library of these templates that you can use as a uh, kind of a bootstrap starting point. Um, and then we get into some of the front end view components. So um, going back to that design system, they're all converted to view components uh, with their own, their own sets of configurability and properties that end up um, uh, representing the final design. Um, and these all live in a storybook. So the story, we, we use storybook as the living uh, design system documentation. And um, so all of those design components are all captured in here. They're all maintained in the same code base. So when you update or add any of the functionality, create new components or update the, um, the properties or configuration associated, then the storybook is just rebuilt. And uh, you know, it's, it's very easy for developers to come in and see exactly how to interface with those at a uh, granular level. Um, Cool, so we'll look at what the, uh, the, the process actually looks like through back end to front end. Um, as mentioned, Drupal content editing is quite standard. You just create nodes, attach routes, use paragraphs, um, put them in menus. So the content authoring experience is very, very traditional, standard Drupal. Um, site configuration, taxonomy led, configurable through um, that taxonomy term. Uh, the middleware is responsible for pulling the content via JSON API. It maps that content and does some data transformation to convert that to those Vue.js uh, design components. Um, and then it compiles a fully static site and deploys it to QuantCDM. Um, and on the front end, uh, all users just interface with that static content, the static artifact through the, the Quant um, content delivery network. Um, and the way it works is when content is edited in the back end, it just compiles the changed artifacts and then pushes those. So uh, they're always up to date um, for end users when they visit the site. Uh, a little bit more about Nux. So um, Nux is a static site generator. It can be configured as, well, a very, in varying ways, one of which is a complete static target, which will create HTML, JavaScript, CSS, uh, which you can just push to um, static hosting solutions. It can also be used as a reverse proxy, um, server-side rendering. Uh, it's a very configurable tool. Um, we've heard a little bit about Drux.js before. So Drux.js is an awesome project. If you're interested in decoupled in general, uh, it may help to bootstrap you on a similar journey. 
um, it was assessed and we didn't use it for this project um, simply because we had some requirements that we needed to tackle ourselves. Um, so that's next. Um, all right, so next we're talking about why go static. So uh, a lot of this is probably pretty obvious, but by moving to a completely static public serve, it gives you a lot of options with your CMS in the back end. Um, so you can imagine by having Drupal not serving any content, we don't really have an attack surface on our CMS. Um, we can move it behind basic auth, we can take Drupal off and put it behind um, private networks, uh, or we can even just turn it off when it's not in use, just take those servers away and, um, and not allow public access. Uh, static's faster. So if you're hitting Drupal and you're rendering content, you're talking about Twig and databases and all of the various layers and systems and subsystems that are required to generate that and deliver that, that page. Um, in this model, the static artifact is only rebuilt when content changes. Um, so you're, own, yeah, you're getting the fastest possible results. Um, static also costs less. So off the back of that, if you aren't using your CMS as much, if you're scaling back your web presence, um, then you can see cost savings. Uh, and it obviously is leaner and wider. Um, that reduces the energy requirements and reduces environmental impact. Uh, so a little bit more about Quant. So Quant is a uh, content delivery network, um, global in nature with 60 odd regions, uh, engineered for static and Jamstack paradigm. Uh, has full support for static site generators like Nux, like we're seeing today, uh, but it also has a integrated Drupal module. So if you're interested in taking a Drupal site and making it static, you can enable that module. It will create static version. It will push it directly to Quant. Uh, and any content change in Drupal will automatically just create a static version and, and push it into Drupal. So it will track content change. Uh, we've got that integrated search solution with a uh, partnership with Algolia. Um, scheduled releases is cool. It's basically a to the second content release globally. So we push the content ahead of time uh, and then you can schedule it for 11.59, 59. And everyone around the world will see that content at the exact uh, moment in time that, that changes. So uh, nobody else is doing anything similar. Um, alongside that, there are traditional CDN controls. So if you want to use it as a traditional CDN, you can. Um, there's also edge content editing. So in the case where Drupal isn't available, for instance, in a DR or failover scenario, you can still edit content through WYSIWYG or code editors. Uh, all of the content and media items are tracked with infinite revisions, uh, which is interesting when talking about Government and Archives Act. You can basically go back and see point in time snapshots of what any page or content looked like uh, at any point in the past. Uh, and with that comes the ability to roll back to historic versions if you need to. Um, all right, so we'll look at uh, the search solution a little bit more. So search is baked into every site, which means that when you create a new site, it will just work, you get site search. And the reason this is possible is because we are using standard and consistent content schemas, uh, which just means that um, you can get a really rich and um, nice search solution out of the box without any development effort. Uh, similarly, when we talked about search widgets and components uh, as managed as content, an example is like this, you know, you basically say, I want to embed a search widget uh, I'm going to restrict it to these content types or page types. I'm going to enable these facets, and, and away you go. You've got, you've got search. Um, cool. So we'll talk about some of the wins and the challenges uh, that we faced along the way. The first win was that the DEA site launched, which was awesome. Uh, so as, as far as pilot site go, uh, it's a pretty awesome um, end result. So encourage you all to go and check that out. Um, at the end of this, this talk. Uh, some of those post-launch results, uh, we've talked about the build process and build times. Um, you can see that it's hovering around 3 minutes 30 for that DEA site. Um, we've got plenty of um, additional ideas and proof of concepts to bring this down to a more consistent one minute kind of build time. Uh, and the way we can do that is through 
iterative build. So we're just building the small iteration uh, and Quant already has full support for uh, comparing MD5s of the built artifacts and what's actually being served in the static edge. So it only pushes content that has actually changed. Um, yeah, SR, SSR report and the uh, security head support uh, looking pretty good, um, as is the Lighthouse. Uh, and because this is all coming from one standard platform, this is all centrally managed by the platform administrators. And it means that adding a new site will immediately give you good results without having to spend additional time redeveloping and, or yeah, rebuilding anything that's, that's just built in from the offset. Uh, some of the challenges. So yeah, it was ambitious. Um, this particular setup, no one has done. No one's built something that's decoupled using WCMS and uh, all the various tooling that we, we used. So there was definitely some, uh, some teething pain along the way. Uh, we had to find the right team with the right skills and a uh, fairly tight timeline and budget. Uh, it's a pilot project after all. Um, in the back end, there was some component complexity. Uh, as I mentioned, we did try to create paragraphs that were configurable, um, which just added a little bit of extra complexity to those components. Um, and naming things, funnily enough, was one of the harder things, largely because of the various people, the various teams, and all of the sy systems that were, um, yeah, design system, Drupal, uh, front end, all had to have similar names to to limit the confusion. Uh, in, the middle, in the middleware, we built that from scratch, as I mentioned, we didn't use Drupst. Uh, we had to handle a whole bunch of edge cases uh, with you know, what happens if you enter weird character encoding uh, in the CMS, what does, uh, what does the build pipeline look at? So um, definitely a lot of hardening that went into that process. Um, and build times, as I mentioned, that's always a challenge when you start to talk about static site generation, uh, especially when you talk about thousands and tens of thousands of pages. Uh, in the front end, there were quite a few parties involved. We had Geoscience Australia, but then the, the programs within Geoscience and making sure that all of the components and the actual final representation would meet their needs. Um, yeah, a, a, few, a few different parties um, to communicate with them. Um, there were many components and the storybook was delayed along the way. So um, standard projects challenges that we all face. In terms of wins though, uh, it was a pretty great outcome. Um, the ones, uh, these are the same goals that we had in those earlier slides. Um, the ones with asterisks are the ones that we are working on um, improving in future dev cycles. Uh, same goes for the project ones. So on the whole, um, we met all of the uh, original, original goals. Uh, and a nice quote from Alan Maskell, the Digital Experience Manager. Uh, Geoscience Australia now has an innovative and sustainable solution for our future platform needs. So that was a really nice, uh, really nice quote from Alan. Uh, okay, so the future of the platform, what can we do to make it even more awesome? Uh, step one, obviously launch more sites. So EFTF, it's one for the future and comm safety are already underway. They will be launching soon uh, with hopefully more to follow. Um, the platform itself, we are hoping to extend beyond the current web um, and extend it to these other applications, these other data rich mapping and scientific applications uh, that can benefit from standardization, consistency, uh, and content and data sharing through an API first lens. And then beyond GA, I mean, at the end of the day, this is a very generic solution. What we've built isn't really tailored entirely to GA. Um, what I would like to see, and off the back of some of the conversations um, in, that, that have come out of the keynote, starter kits and sharing what we're doing here. Um, because at the end of the day, the more people who are going on this journey and sharing in the same sets of tooling, like Drux, JS, um, yeah, then the better off we'll all be. Um, so if there's any interest in what GA are doing, uh, I'm certain that they'd be willing to share um, what, they've, what they've got and uh, the more people that contribute and, and share in what we're doing, the better, ultimately. Uh, looking forward to D10. So um, Olivero, uh, when we talk about what we're actually offering, what we're actually using Drupal for, it's purely the content authoring experience. So anything that we do in the 
content admin side is obviously uh, going to improve this platform considerably. So same goes for CK Editor and the um, extensions on the API First initiative. As Lee mentioned, what's happening with exposing uh, menu items and um, some of the other improvements via JSON API, uh, we'll be able to piggyback those improvements for sure. Uh, and PHP 8, obviously, is faster than 7. Uh, we'll see a snappier uh, admin interface. Uh, also interested to see where we go with uh, decoupled components uh, and front ends to directly consume uh, some, of, some of that content. Um, cool. So we're into questions. That's it for me. Just have a look. All right, so first question, is it open source or is there anywhere we can see the code? So yeah, as I said, I would love to see a starter kit or something that we can base from this, that um, we can have a broader community uh, input. Um, after this, we'll have a chat with, uh, with the fine folks at Geoscience Australia and, and see what we can do to progress that. But at the moment, the answer is no. Um, we'd love to see it though. Uh, web forms, yep, that's a good one. So Quant CDN has built in support for web forms. What it can do is effectively just capture any of the post submission data and uh, stores it in a separate secure enclave. Um, so it, it's kind of built in. There isn't actually web forms on that DEA site. It wasn't in their requirements, but the platform can handle it when the time comes. Maintenance and support plans for the middleware. Yeah, so obviously this being a bespoke and custom solution at the moment, uh, there is an ongoing support contract that's in place to manage and maintain um, and keep regular patching cycles and all of the rest ongoing. One of the benefits though is by having this decoupled solution is Drupal's actually doesn't have any public access. So when it comes to patching cycle and managing highly critical patches, um, the exposure risk isn't there on the CMS side. Um, the middleware is all contained within a CI pipeline as well. So, uh, yeah, there's not really a lot of exposure risk, but uh, there's an ongoing maintenance burden associated with that. Uh, the new system present geoscience data. No, but that is definitely uh, when we talked about the future of the platform and raising some of the scientific data, um, that is absolutely on the roadmap and on the agenda to try and create more standard and consistent ways to bring that scientific data uh, to the websites. So yeah, definitely on the, on the roadmap. At a staging work when a new term site is created live and locked behind the server restrictions. Uh, yes, so at the moment, they've got different environments. So content at the moment, they can create in a separate environment, which is hooked up to a different static serve, uh, which has basic auth in front of it. So it's not ideal. Um, again, on the roadmap is preview environments. So when they're creating draft content, it will be pushing that draft content through to a preview environment. What that's is some of those initiatives in Drupal core largely revision um, capabilities through JSON API. So we look forward to tackling that one when the time comes. Uh, the project fit into original time frame and budget. Yes, mostly. So it did go over a little bit, but you know, a week or so. Uh, it wasn't too drastic. Um, having said that, we did have to cut some of the original features down to try and meet the budget. Um, it was it was quite an ambitious project. Oh, 
Let's see, I'm supposed to press the tick button on it. So that's it. I think that might be it for questions. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining. If you have any follow-up questions or anything else that you'd like to discuss, then feel free to reach out. Uh, I'll just put up the contact slide. So um, I'm on the uh, Drupal Slack or Twitter or various other means. So if you want to reach out, then feel free, feel free at any point. That's all.